Paul. What's going on, everybody? And welcome back. And usually welcome back is a lot more uh, loosely thrown around. But in this case, welcome back is probably the perfect uh, sentence to use right now because Jesus, does it feel like it's actually been a long time? Uh, we used to joke when we hopped on here about like, oh, yeah, feeling like it's been a, been a while. It's actually legitimately been a while, like a good, uh, you know, month and probably close to a month and a half, honestly. Um, but uh, glad to be back nonetheless. Um, sir, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. I mean, we're halfway through all of the eras and we've lost a lot of people on the show. So there's a lot to a lot happening. A lot of discussions but it's good to be back to kind of chat about it yeah you know we uh, made a couple videos from the very start of the season you know in relation to you know prevalent talking points like you know when uh after that first what was that what they call it again when um we, it was like an unofficial purge when uh a bunch the of error errors, invitational. Error invitational there we go i almost called it a summit um <laughs> we basically had um yeah we we lost a lot of people so you know we obviously if you guys go back and want to revisit that we had a you know top 10 challengers who left seasons too early so that was something we did and then our most recent last video we did about a month and a change ago was um dumbest decisions uh made in challenge history and that was right off the heels of uh what happened with tony and avery's episode so um since then there's clearly been uh, a lot of developments to have uh taken place within the challenge world but i would venture to say and um you know if you wanted to chime in yourself feel free to but correct me if i'm wrong over the course of the last month it does definitely feel like the laurel and uh car maria um saga has uh taken up a lot of i guess you could say people's thoughts and uh opinions over the last month or so yeah, and it's definitely one of those relationships that even if there's just a, a small interaction, it will be included in the episode. Um, like last week's challenge, the gladiator one that was, you know, the replica of Riot Act from Cutthroat. Cutthroat. When Laurel helped out Kara, that may be it, even though they did nothing. They did not get Tori off the platform. So... Anytime they have a small interaction, we will see it. Um, and I feel like before this season, when the trailer first came out, that was the moment that everyone, that piqued everyone's interest. They wanted to know what was happening between Kara and Laurel, and they were waiting for that altercation to happen. Well, yeah, because there was a lot of like, you know, spoiler season in general is always a talking point, but there was a lot of like, he said, she said things going on. As to like in regards to what was said, how serious it got, you know, and we obviously it's um, it's ironic how you said about every interaction, little or big, we're going to see between them because the biggest interaction was not not even arguably, you could say, I think it was pretty clear cut. That's the one that got shown the least because, yes, we while we did see you know, Kara's sort of body language after the fact and how, you know, emotional she got and bits and pieces of how intense it got. We obviously, um, we didn't really see the entire picture, um, you know, of what was said and, you know, don't really want to get into the weeds as far as like speculation goes because some of the alleged uh, things that were thrown around is kind of like, um, you know, not really in our hands to kind of speak yeah. on. Um, I mean, there's definitely a lot of really damning topics that, you know, if I if I said that they were definitively true, I would be wrong. But I, what I will say is Cara Maria did talk about it on TikTok a little bit, and she said Laurel had brought up moments in her past in relationships that may have, you know, may have been somewhat abusive, Again, we don't know the extent of that, um, but we do kind of see some some chatter around Polly and how Polly has been supportive of her, and that makes the final edit seemingly out of nowhere. 
-hmm. His name is brought up out of nowhere during the interaction. And I guess according to Kara's TikTok, that is where it comes from. Um, I'm only only saying what she said on TikTok, so I don't know any inside information. No, I, I saw the TikTok as well. Um, so, you know, if you guys by some chance haven't seen or heard of it yourself, then there's some more context for you. Um, you know, get it from the, the horse's mouth. No pun intended. Car used to have a horse, but. Um, too soon. Yeah. No, if that was too soon, I take it back. But I mean, hey, listen, I didn't come up with the figure of speech. The horse's mouth can apply to anybody, you know. So <laughs> if you want to take it from the direct source is probably a better way to put it. Um, go ahead and check out that TikTok. But um, without further ado, the whole reason why I brought up Cara and Laurel is because I've been, the whole plan was to kind of talk about this topic to begin with. Um Basically, off the heels of that was going to be us then getting the idea to talk about some of the other more, I guess you could say, maybe ugliest moments in challenge history, cringiest moments. And what we're implying is if a moment got like to the point where it was like kind of one of those moments where you kind of have to brace yourself when you watch it, but it's really enticing that like you almost can't look away from. So basically with our intentions here the barometers were as wide as like a ct and atom type of situation or like a you know like laurel and big easy like hunter and ashley final reckoning i'm coming for your family if this that and the third anything like that those barometers kind of could be something as ugly as something said or maybe even a physical altercation that is um, kind of the barometers here. So we came up with the best we could find. And, um, you know, that's going to be today's video. Um, but before we get into that, we're just going to kind of give our brief um, thoughts and opinions now on us being on the midway point of um, season 40. So, um, you know, without further ado, um, I guess a good place to start with that would be um, when you look at this uh, lineup of people still available, who maybe jumps out to you as somebody who's either surprised or impressed you up to this point thus far when you look at who's left? So full transparency, I kind of knew. And, you know, a lot of people who follow the spoilers have inklings of who will make it that far. Um, so a lot of the people that have made it to this point, I'm not – shocked by but how they got there is a little bit surprising i always said from the day that aviv's name came out in the cast reveal she was going to be treated like a born again rookie and that probably meant she was going to make it kind of far every season seems to have like that one rookie that makes it really really deep into the game and aviv seems to be that person this season so i can't say i'm like super shocked by her i'm a little bit surprised by the fact that Olivia has been unscathed this whole season, other than the Evers Invitational, just kind of skated by, um, hasn't really had to do a whole lot, and is sitting pretty. Um, whereas Jenny is like a target, and they're coming for her every time. Um, so I feel like in the crossfires of Era 4 with the Vacation Alliance and Jenny, Olivia is just kind of sitting pretty. Well, yeah, <clears throat> I, you kind of got the impression when it came to like, again, you know, I didn't make it to the end of 39, but where I watched up to was probably about midway. Um, and it felt like for the first half of last season, Olivia skated by as well, really, without doing much. But then obviously she got her hands a bit dirty at the end and then kind of honestly fell into more of a villain ish role despite not really wanting to step into it like she was she became kind of a villain by the end of 39 i would say olivia but um you know she never really like fully fed into the villain role you know what i mean so we kind of were honestly left with like a question mark on olivia going into 40 where you know she had a super impressive um first season on uh rider dies and was a fan favorite and then came into 39 and 
didn't really do a whole lot for majority of that season up until like the end where she got a little bit messy with her gameplay. Um, well, the infamous elimination that she orchestrated, Norris, Horacio, and Kyland are all on this season. So yeah. there are five people, Olivia, Michelle, and those three who were on season 39 that came on to season 40. So the majority should have been against Olivia. Um, well, Norris was, was here for a cup of coffee, obviously. So, you know, nothing really could have happened of substance there. But I mean, she took a swing. She was the one that put Olivia into a lim- or wanted to put Olivia into elimination. And Horacio had the power to do that. So it's not for lack of effort. I mean, they yeah. people thought that they were going to be against Olivia and they were. Um, yeah. So. But yeah, after that, she's sitting pretty. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I mean, you you know, you point out Aviv, you point out Olivia. I look at some of the people who, you know, we came into this season when people see the cast list, a huge focal point, and I harped on it a lot, was uh, the inclusion of um, people such as Ryan and Derek on uh, Era 2, where, like, you, know, you know, when you look at the list and the names, they don't jump out immediately at you when you see those two names in particular you know i know brandon kind of got looped in there a little bit too before the season because um you know people might have thought like there was more uh maybe noteworthy names from era two but you know i think that the fact that they're still available um has shown um that at the very least uh derek's kind of showing that maybe his performance on all stars four um was more i guess maybe indicative of who he actually is as a competitor and it wasn't just like you know a fluke of him making it to the end of that because it's an all-star season like i think he's kind of showing that like he could be a quality player on like a regular type of season no matter whether it's all-star or flagship and that is for ryan um you know he's getting into some more uh, I would say <laughs> drama um, of late. And that's something I've really wanted to see from Ryan because it felt like for a long time, Ryan was always kind of just a guy who was just there and like a room reader and would kind of just like be observant of stuff. But like we never really got like much from him himself, if that makes sense. You know, like if you look at some of his old seasons, you know, Fresh Meat too. Yes, he was playing like double agent per se with like the alliances with Kenny West, but he himself never like would uh, was known for making like these huge moves or getting involved in like storylines or anything like that. He was kind of just a guy to, there to just like sit back. And, um, you know, if he's going to get into some more stuff, then that's a welcomed addition, in my opinion, because I think the show could really use some, uh, some gay representation uh, when it comes to like people really sticking their neck out there and providing something either from a storyline or a game perspective, because we're sorely in need of that. Yeah. Well, I think one thing that when you see like the, the kind of oddball casting choices, the benefit of having that is that the team is no longer going to be unanimous with everything. And you have like the Derek and the Ryans on era two, and now they're going to counter the majority <laughs> of like bananas and Laurel. And mm. it kind of is less clear cut. Um, so it's cool that they made it this far. Era two is sitting really strong. I'm also kind of surprised, but kind of not that Nehemiah is just kind of doing as well as he's doing. Um, I expected him to be targeted a bit more, but I, you know, if you watched any of the All Star seasons, you know he's pretty good. Like even yeah. in today's era, he's pretty good. So I'm not shocked that he got as far as he did. Just that he was able to kind of largely float by, and all he, I mean, he did take out CT, which is a pretty big feat. Well, CT go not only did he go out early, which isn't like super unheard of. I mean, we saw him go out early, you know, on both um, War of the Worlds 
one and total madness and final reckoning if you want to be technical um so it's not like we hadn't seen him go out early within the past like five or six years but i think because of how we last saw him you know he won two in a row on double agents and you know spies lies and allies and because it's the 40th season you know him leaving as early as he did um kind of almost feels weird in a way um for him to not be involved in the end game he seemed like a you know a bit mentally just checked out i felt like maybe not checked out but he kind of just didn't really have like what seemed to be like that switch this season where like he's super locked in on the game he kind of just felt like a little bit like happy to be there yeah um i think like anyone that kind of follows him knew that prior to this um he kind of had like personal a stuff going on, on. Yeah. and this was just just kind of like a break from the drama and legal mumble jumbo that he was going through um mm-hmm. but also because of that he probably wasn't in his prime <laughs> you know it took away yeah. from training um and even when he's not in his work, worst shape, he's a very astute player, and he knows how to, like, lead the team. But mm. um, of all the ways for him to go out, as someone that works in construction, going out to Zen, peaceful Nehemiah in a hammering contest, not the best look. But um, hey, he took it in stride. He gave Nehemiah all the props in the world, and at least he, he did have a great attitude leaving. Yeah. Well, you know, it remains to be seen whether we see CT again or not. Um, I would personally love to really see him on an all-star season um, because we haven't seen him on one of those yet, and I'd be interested to see like him kind of interact with uh, that crowd more. than Because I- I- I'll be honest, like I think I'm good with seeing CT as far as like on flagship with all these younger people and stuff. I, I don't I really ready. care to see him with those people. I would rather see him on all stars i don't know if you watched the traders on peacock um mm-hmm. ct trishel and bananas were on there yeah um, so the first time i had seen ct since he won spies lies and allies and i felt like he skated through that season like that was no oh, yeah bad. yeah he showed up in really great shape but he he mm-hmm. skated yeah yeah and he had emmy which was his you know scrappy to his scooby-doo and he was just no stopping him mm-hmm. anyhow um, it was really great to watch a season like the traders where CT had to put in some work and he still had it. Like he was, he was great throughout that season. And I was definitely rooting for him because it wasn't obvious how he was going to do. And it was like, I just kind of, it was refreshing to see him in that type of environment where he actually had to do work and he was playing the game. Um, so if you haven't seen that show and you're a CT fan, can't recommend it enough. Well, there you go, guys. If you need someone to watch tonight, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, go it's and a, watch it won awards. It's it's a good show. How long do you feel like um, logistically this season might uh, last in terms of timeline? Because you know we're in the uh, towards the midway point, leaning more towards the latter half of October here, and we're at midway of this season. Do you feel like when it comes to, um, you know, because I know in seasons past when it comes to like those bigger milestone type of like Dirty 30 we saw, Final Reckoning was the end of an era. They stretch these things out, you know, it's over 20 episodes or more. Um, do you feel like this is one that they're going to look to, you know, prolong like maybe, you know, where where do you feel like calendar wise we might end off when it comes to this season? So I thought it was always supposed to be 19 episodes, and that would put the end date right at Christmas, um, like oh. right around Christmas, because it, it would be foolish to have this show and end it right before or right after Christmas with like one episode left. People would just kind of fall off. There'd be breaks. Oh. And it would be confusing. Um, but then the timeline got shifted a week when they didn't have an episode for the VMAs. So I'm not really sure. I'm thinking it's probably going to be 18, 19 episodes around Christmas time. Um, it will end, but 
I'm, I'm not sure at this point. I've looked at the press releases and stuff. They they don't say. Um, but remember, last season they had uh, two for one episodes, like three and four, or one mm-hmm. night, which was I remember that. Yeah, wild watching. Maybe they, a, maybe they do a two and one finale or something. I know that it, maybe it was War of the Worlds two that they combined the reunion. It was supposed to be two episodes. And then they just made one super long two-hour reunion. Maybe that. Which I would prefer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. I mean, they uh, could definitely go on a number of routes here. All I know is if I'm giving Santa one idea for, for Christmas, it's uh, let's have All-Stars 5 out and early for uh, the start of 2025. Because um, that's uh, where my interest really lies right now. Um, oh, that's the main event. That is the main event, folks. Um, if you haven't gotten on it, make sure you guys go down the rabbit hole. We, you know, did a whole like, you know, speculatory uh, stuff all the way back, like probably about now would be like six months ago. Um, yeah, just a while to think about. But um, without further ado, let's get into uh, today's topic, which is some of the more, you know, nasty stuff. We're really getting into the thick of things now, folks. You know, if you guys, you know, like things, sunshines, rainbows, you might want to plug your ears now because from here on out, (laughs) things are going to get pretty nasty. Um, We're talking about the ugliest moments in uh, challenge history, essentially. So, um, yeah, we're going to be discussing maybe some fights, maybe some, you know, things said, anything within that kind of ballpark we're going to be, you know, discussing. So. if you would like to take the floor and uh, maybe say one of yours, feel free yeah, to. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of these things, you can't really, like, say that you love them because they're aggressive and rude. But I love this fight. Um, and this is, like, one of the ones that goes way back. But there was a clip of it last night, if you watched episode nine. And it is Julie and Melissa on uh, Battle of the Sexes. Or Melissa comes oh, to the yeah. competition and she's like, just so you know, I don't like you. We're not friends. Don't talk to me. And it all stems from apparently pay conflicts at the time. Julie and Melissa and the whole real world New Orleans cast had been doing college appearances. And Julie was orchestrating fees so she would get more appearances. That was the... <laughs> That presented was that. Her, mom, her mom was the agent or something like that, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, and they revisit this on um homecoming, homecoming. in 2022. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I remember watching that in 2003. Not that, not that I was old back then, but in 2003, and it stuck with me ever since. And clearly, the fans, the fans still like to see it. Well, you know, I would I wouldn't know uh, that it was shown on Homecoming because we can't watch it anymore. But uh, <laughs> no, but I I'm joking. I actually did watch it on Homecoming when it was on Paramount for the short time that it was, and so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, well, you know, I appreciate you going with a deep cut on that one because you know I think um, with a lot of what I have on here, there's quite a few Final Reckoning stuff. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, and a couple few broad ones, but, um, I'm actually going to go with a half lighthearted one, but like almost kind of a bit serious because I'm going to be talking about when Johanna threatened to, uh, sell Wes's house on uh, the ruins. If he was going to throw, um, the challenges because, while there was like a bit of jest in that statement, we don't really know like how serious Johanna like really, really was about uh, doing it. For all we know, she was dead serious, but like, you know, basically blackmailing him almost <laughs> like they were kind of making a joke, but like seriously at the same time. So now let's think about it. This is a whole ass house. Now, I don't know how much houses cost in 2008. They were cheaper, a lot cheaper. But if Johanna won this season, 
she was walking home with $40,000 or something like that. It's nice money, but is it worth getting into a legal battle over a house to potentially avoid jeopardizing that money? Especially when we consider Johanna just kind of like noped out of the game. So do I think she's being serious? Not really. I think she wanted the reaction. Well, my question is, because they were, would have already been broken up at this point. Wes would have been with Kellyanne, technically. How would she still have, like, the name under her house? Like, I'm assuming, like, well, not assuming. Like, they definitely didn't live with each other at that point anymore. So it's kind of like. Well, they probably, you know, they probably buy it. They were in a relationship and they weren't married. They probably both put down money, um, mm-hmm. 50-50. And. It, it would have had to have been 50-50, I think, because mm-hmm. otherwise Johanna wouldn't have had the pull that she would have. But that's all speculation. Yeah, we'll never know, folks, um, we'll unless know. I asked. I should have asked her when I interviewed her. But um, anyways, I digress. Uh, you can go ahead with another one of yours. I suppose I'll go with the most obvious one which is CT and Adam on the dual two. Um, I think that one will live down in infamy. It won't live on Paramount Plus because you can't find it there, but it will live down in infamy and they will always show the clips. Um, and I mean, it's it's one of those fights that obviously it's kind of gruesome to watch. And we still hear like little details. I know Brad just talked about some details um, on another yeah. podcast. But yeah, I, I certainly don't condone CT punching at him in the level of aggression that was put towards it. But to some level, Adam knew that he was playing with fire here, and he proceeded. He he knew that CT and DM had a relationship. He knew that he was trying to get under CT's skin in some way. I don't think he anticipated CT would react in the way that he did, but he knew he was pushing buttons. Could you imagine telling somebody in uh, 2007, 8, whenever this thing aired, that like in 2024, we would be talking about both of these guys' reputations in the public eye going in totally opposite directions, but it's not who you think uh, ends up going in the better direction. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) BT has been given a lot of chances to redeem himself. Yeah. Adam has been given a few, but not not as many. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, Adam's somebody we haven't seen in a really long time. I don't know if we're ever going to see him again. Um, and, um, I'm, yeah, I, don't, I, mean, I guess we'll have yeah. to just wait and see on that one. Um, actually, no, we did technically see him um, on CT's uh, – home turf uh, episode. I mean, it wasn't anything new content, but it, he was mentioned and name dropped. So, you know. Yeah. So, for whatever I that's mean, worth. Whatever, for whatever it's worth, we still talk about him. There's a lot of people that have faded away over the past couple of years. Adam gets talked about more. There's some of which undeservedly so. Like, the fact that we're not talking about Dunbar on a regular basis, week in and week out, somebody in that MTV Paramount uh, production crew is probably going to have to be throwing papers and stuff to kind of really get this thing situated with the editing speak team. For, I mean, the fact that speak for yourself because I am talking about Dunbar day in and day out, so I don't know what you're I, talking. I, about. Listen, I mean, I believe you, but I, I say my prayers every night before I go to bed, before I eat dinner. I thank dunbar for this uh meal I, you know it's 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 become kind of a you know way of life for me at this point so um, absolutely the only way <laughs> yeah the only way well speaking of only ways i feel like there's this is the only way for this topic to exist if nothing else because um this one is um quite literally speaks for itself um and you could be actually asking yourself which Camilla moment, but I'm going to be talking about 
what I feel is the Camilla moment at this point when you think of her now. And um, that is, unfortunately, the moment with her and Leroy on Dirty 30. Um, you can make the argument that this is probably like top three to five, maybe most ugliest moments um, to have at least happened within the past, like, you know, 10 seasons or so. Um, and this is basically served as like a um, one of the somewhat dark stains in terms of like, mm -hmm. you know, within the last recent years, obviously, since like the BLM movement, D, obviously, um, you know, we know what happened with her. Now that the, the BLM movement became like such a talking point and like just in general, I feel like it's almost like made the Camilla stuff age even worse. Mm -hmm. than it did at the time when it came out because we all know you know in 2017 when this thing aired it was ugly and she received backlash but they still let her finish the season and she won the thing i mean sure they like phased her out a little bit in the edit but like and she didn't go to the reunion but they casted her technically after that for champ stars too mm -hmm. So they were they were very clearly willing to give her as many more chances as possible had she not basically struck a producer. Um, yeah, we're calling and spade a spade. Leroy has spoken out about this, and I think the big difference about D and Camilla. Well, firstly, I think objectively, if you look at it, the severity of the comments are drastically different, and the larger punishment went on the wrong side of that equation. But they took action very swiftly, and, you know, it was very visible in the public eye how D was impacted. They kind of let Camilla just kind of fester in the game. They brought her, you know, she stayed in a hotel, got to watch TV, came back the next day. Um, you know, production, it seems to me production is not happy with the way that they responded. And it's kind of like a blemish on their reputation, especially with people like Leroy speaking out as to how they handle situations that are racially sensitive. And, you know, I don't know if we'll ever see anything from, from Camilla again, but like every viewer knows if Camilla is not coming back, it's because of Champs versus Stars and not Dirty 30, because she was on Champs versus Stars. They, they would have been better off not even, like, airing the footage of Cam or promoting that Camilla was even there on Champ Stars. Like, well, I'm, she I'm did dead. the first challenge. So yeah, she did the had, first. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to be honest with you, it could have just been a test run for, for production because they had to do the, the same thing on the very next season, Vendettas, and edit someone out after the first challenge, so... Apparently, that's not out of the cards. <clears throat> the difference between, like, the D stuff without getting, like, too deep into the weeds of things is, like, D made comments that, like, you could kind of, like, chalk up. She, like, basically what she said was super insensitive given the time frame, but, like, her comments and how she said them kind of just were in the same vein as like some stupid like teenager on the internet just making like some stupid troll comment whereas camilla actually targeted another cast member and like basically told them almost in a like used like their um you know skin color as like almost like a you know an insult to try and insinuate that like they were um like either lesser than or like that was like something wrong with them. Whereas D yeah. just made like stupid comments like that were insensitive given like the severity of what was going on in the world at the time. Yeah. I mean, I think objectively most people can kind of see that there's different intent behind the interactions, not saying that any of the interactions are acceptable, but like I like I said, the worst punishment went to the less deserving person. Yeah, um, which I mean, I mean, where there's like probably quite a few moments of Camilla we could have included on this, um, but anyhow, um, yeah, you could uh, take the floor here. Well, I think I'll I'll move into one that I think is universally 
considered more lighthearted, um, even though I love the person at the center of this outburst. And that is Joe versus the island of Trinidad and Tobago um, on the gauntlet too. Um, now, I will say I watched Real World San Francisco before I ever watched um, the gauntlet too. And I liked Joe. I, I was, a you know, I thought she was a good addition to the cast and, you know, she was just generally kind of like a sweet person. So it was very mm -hmm. uncharacteristic of her to have such a huge reaction. And I know I actually was really excited a few years ago when she came onto your podcast because she gave more insights and it just kind of helped to understand her perspective. Although personally, I never really cared. It's a reality TV show. If the worst thing you've done in life is make a fool of yourself on reality TV, at least you found, you found the right place to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, that was a super long time ago and social media was basically almost nothing. Um, but I think, you know, it had social, had Gauntlet 2 pretty much existed during a time when tweeting existed. We all would have been super surprised to see her name pop up on that cast because, you know, one, she hadn't even done a challenge at that point, but also like, you know, Joe came in as a replacement for Puck, right? Mm -hmm. On, uh, you know, her real world season that occurred, what was it, like 11 years prior or something like that? It was like some yeah. uh, crazy statistic or something. Like, I think at that point, what was it? Like? I think that was like the biggest gap or it still might be the biggest gap in between the time that somebody made their debut on a. Uh, yeah, that, that's a. Good question. In between the real world and the challenge, it probably still is. Um, I do remember in 2005, not that I was old then, that I remember watching the reveal of the cast back on Tube Scan, if any of the fans out there know. Um, and I was like, why? Um, I know that that cast, they were having a hard time getting, like, filling all the slots because all of the same old dependable people we're not doing the season, but um, that was just a big head scratcher. Um, well, you know what that was too is Joe was actually um, acting at the time, believe it or mm -hmm. not, and um, the, I think there was actually a writer strike going on uh, during that time period, and that's why she did it because yeah. you know Hollywood was closed and acting wasn't, you know, they weren't opening jobs or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah no. I mean, if, I don't know. If she wanted to leave, she wouldn't have had any a hard time doing it through the, the regular challenge. I mean, she was team captain. Do you really think that Cameron's going to win you all these challenges? Like, it's not happening. So you could just, I, like, finally yourself all that way. Listen, call me crazy. I think she actually might have been a pretty deceptively good competitor if she stuck around. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have no reason to believe that she would have tanked. Yeah. Um, shout out Joe, by the way, because I still do actually, you know, keep keep in touch with her a good amount. She's a super uh, cool person, actually. So Yeah, no, uh, I saw some of her like tweets and stuff in more recent years, and she's a very kind, nice person to follow on social media. Yeah, super supportive, all that fun jazz. Um, you know, since we're on the topic of violence. I didn't really, this one's more broad. I mean, I just, I literally didn't highlight a particular moment, but since, you know, some moments will come to mind, I'm sure now that we're talking about this, uh, we're talking about the island, the season. Um, since we're on the topic of Island of Tobago, I feel like that's a natural uh, transition here. Um, you know, the island's pretty much like, I feel like outside of the horrible living conditions, the story of this season is basically the treatment of like the women kind of um, with how like horrible, like Johnny and Kenny more specifically talk to them. Like there was, um, I guess I'll just talk and that's oh, shit. I mean, this is opening up a can of worms, but um, I, you know, I got to just got to call it how I see it. There's one interaction between, uh, you know, Kenny and um, Tanya, um, on this season 
where like I think they're like arguing or whatever. And um, you know, Kenny uses some pretty uh, you know, derogatory verbiage where he's telling her, like, oh, I don't talk to all women like this. I just talk to, you know, such and so, whatever, you know, fill in those blanks or just go back and watch it. And it's kind of crazy too to think about the time period, like you know, things that like you'd get canceled for, like that are said today, like in watching old seasons, like they don't like blur out like you know, the word, like the R word when talking about like, you know, if you're calling somebody a re, like they don't blur it out, like they leave it there. So it's just kind of like wild, like the time frames now with uh, seeing this stuff. But um, yeah, I guess there's that that stuck out there. I mean, there was a couple with like bananas telling Kellyanne to go take her medication and then like you know, some other shit about like her with her lip fillers. And it was just a pretty ugly season overall, you could say. Yeah. Um, that season is just kind of a mess. Um, and I think if there's one takeaway from that, it's that if you give people a, a challenge season without any actual challenges, the way they fill their time, you might not like what you see. Because there's a lot of just kind of like really dumb comments that are made, even for that time period. There are certain things that were never acceptable, but more commonplace in 2008. Um, but some of the things that they said, I don't, I don't think were that acceptable. That was just a poorly constructed season, honestly. I mean, they clearly were trying to emulate the Survivor formula and, you know, capitalize off the popularity of that. But, like, Survivor is a lot more nuanced than the shit that they gave us on <laughs> on uh, the island. Yeah. So, but uh, you, you uh, the floor is yours here. So... Perhaps this is what, to be honest with you, this is the most uncomfortable one, in my opinion, to watch as a viewer, like the most utterly uncomfortable one to watch. And that will be Bloodlines, most specifically the reunion when they have Abe, Tom, and Cara Maria. The whole narrative with Abe on that season is just very cringeworthy to me. Um, and I don't think they were doing either Abe nor Cara Maria a favor by having the two together. Um, it was very uncomfortable to watch. Like you could tell that mentally like this just, it, it was not good for her to be on this season with him. But also you could tell that Abe, who is known for being a very emotional person, was put in a situation that is only designed to break him. And it seemed like Tom got the brunt of that anger on the reunion. But it it's like the hardest thing as a challenge viewer for me to watch. And I, it's like the only thing I might skip going back. Yeah, that entire sequence is like pretty uncomfortable to uh, see now. Even the after show, the... Um... Some of the dialogue on the season itself and some of those moments, it's just pretty kind of nasty to look back at now. Um, yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the head. That's kind of some stuff like that's, um, yeah, honestly, I think Abram's probably somebody that I'm confident we don't really end up seeing again. Yeah. Um, it seems like we almost got him. We almost did twice. And, you know, obviously some stuff's happened since then. So it's kind of like, you know, he got COVID, I think, on All Stars 1, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then on All Stars 2, he was set to go. And he, like a week or so before leaving, like, I think, like, either ruptured or tore his Achilles, like, training for the. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. Kahuta oh, wow. said that. Yeah, they were both set to go together because they're close. And Abram, mm -hmm. like, literally training for the show and ruptured his Achilles. Wait, so. Abram's close with whom? Kahata. Oh, Kahata, yes. I think he yeah. was also slated to go on Champs versus Stars, too. 
I think. Yeah, I heard something about that way back. Um, I mean, I, I don't doubt it. I mean, you know, shorter filming length. Yeah. You know, in the States. Yeah, but that's just a rumor. Bring that back, too, while they're at it. <laughs> Seriously. That was fun. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, I actually have written down here Laurel times three, except one of those we already addressed at the top here, so that doesn't need to be said. So I guess I'm just going to loop this into two and one. Um, Laurel. We've got two moments that really stand out, and it's the the one with um, Big Easy on uh, Cutthroat. That's a little you know, hard to digest a bit there. And then, uh, you know, there's the one with Paula on, uh, you know, Rivals 1, which is, you know, their favorite clip, by the way, because they always show the one clip of Laurel comforting Car like 15 years ago to justify everything that happens today. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> As like I, Laurel having Car's back. Not that there's anything wrong with this, but I would be remiss to not tell you that we watched the clip of Laurel criticizing Paula for being 39 on the challenge. This season, Laurel is 39 on the challenge. Just saying. Was Laurel, I mean, was Paula wasn't even 39 though. Like no, she was like I'm, I'm pretty 29. sure. I was. Yeah. No, people were not that but old. At the on time that. that was yeah, but at the time, if you were 30 or pushing 30 on the show you were seen as old i guess yeah i mean no that's true that's true but it's not old no because that same thing happened with coral on the gauntlet three and beth they were yeah. like you know age shaming them i have always said this i feel bad for beth because she got made fun of but for being 35 year old 35 years old and on the challenge by people who who grew up to be 35 years old and on the challenge. Like she, she was doing it first. Listen, you, but, you make a great point. Just don't let her hear this. She might get, um, you know, a little bit of a big head. Maybe. Um, but what I will say about the actual, the two arguments with Laurel is that they're very drastically different in my eyes because the big easy one just seems to come out of nowhere, at least as a viewer. Um, whereas the Paula one, I think objectively the comments are worse. But there's the also comments, the comments are worse. Yes, the comments yeah. are worse. But there's an but... understanding as a viewer that this is a form of deflection because yeah. Paula is contributing to Cara Maria feeling bullied and essentially saying it without saying it, Laurel goes over to Paula and is telling her, you can't be a bully because I can bully you on all these topics. And it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what's, what's still funny though, is like at the cutthroat reunion when uh big easy, they bring him out through like, I think the crowd or something like that. I'll, I'll, I'll never understand this, by the way. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. They bring Big Easy out through the crowd, right? And um, he goes and sits, like, near Laurel. And, like, he's trying to tell her, like, oh, you know, Katie gave you my number. Like, you had all this time in between the show ending to apologize to me. And Laurel claims that she reached out. And, and Big Easy says that Katie... Uh, says she never did and honestly i never knew who was lying but i'm gonna sit here and say laura lied probably i mean you know what else is funny too since we're talking about abram <laughs> I, I i want you to go back when you have the chance to watch that reunion because in that exact same segment abram gets up in the middle of this argument and he's like i can't do this anymore and big easy's like like what are you talking about? Like basically saying like, I'm the victim in this situation. And Abram saying like this behavior that I've been seeing, like I, I can't. And he gets up and leaves and Big Easy's like, I don't know what he's getting mad at me for. I'm the one that got. <laughs> like, Is he just a polar bear? 
Because he's trying yes, to promote yes, his children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good times. That's a great <laughs> reunion. I don't know why they don't have it on TV, on streaming. It's a it's a joke. They don't? No. They don't have the cutthroat? They really don't. They really don't. Maybe, no. I might have seen it on Daily Motion then. Yeah. That I mean, might be. There are some good trolls out there that like to give us all the play. <laughs> yeah, so it is a good terrible. reunion. Paul, Paula was like really drunk during it and she got into a fight with Dunbar and she also got into one with Brad and Tori. <laughs> she was kind of a mess at that reunion. And I'm not gonna lie, Dunbar was pretty was pretty uh you know, I know I do give him a lot of credit, but I will give him like justifiable credit here. He actually had a, a few pretty honestly spot on lies um lines to Paula when he's pretty much telling her like Oh, you play the same sloppy game every time. That's why you never win, or something like that. And he was and like, then kind all of all says is, "But did you get paid?" She did. Did she did say that though? I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure. And yeah, then he, really things got really, point. things got really mm-hmm. awkward and quiet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that was was that me. I think that was me. Yeah. Just, um, just went. I tried to find some more recent ones. There aren't a lot of really, you know, the show now likes to edit, edit all the serious drama out. But for the fans who watched All Stars on the recent season, we got a glimpse at a really intense fight between Janelle and Ayana. Oh, which, yeah. Yeah, that was, I, I think what we saw doesn't really do it justice. But I think they're also, to be fair, the conversations that were had were really compromising for Janelle. And I'm kind of, in a sense, I'm glad we didn't see the full thing if Janelle was being torn down unright, unrightly, unrightfully so. Um, because there's no need to put like that negative narrative into the world against her. But what we did see was still pretty, pretty intense. Yeah, I think given the real world circumstances, just with topics these days, but also the fact that Ayana was dealing with a tough time during when this was airing, I think that uh, production chose to kind of take a uh, a watered down route so that way fans wouldn't hop down Ayana's throat during a troubling time. Yeah, and but I will I- say later on in the season – or later on in, in the same episode, they they don't do Ayana any favors. They have her do like that 45 minute speech um at the deliberation and they just like turn it into a big joke. And then Ayana is supposed to nominate two people and she only nominates Jasmine, who she swore she was gonna keep safe. Like it's it's comical to watch. Um I mean, I really, really do like Ayana. She was playing a sloppy game. Um, but like I said, if you're going to be a mess, reality TV is the place to do it. So I don't hate her for, for playing a messy game. Listen, I'm going to sit here and say this. Ayana's good for the show. Argue with the wall. Maybe she says some things that are kind of – you know, on the uh, spectrum of what should and shouldn't be said, but she's good for the show. And if you can't see that, then, you know, you might need some glasses because her and Hasella, in my opinion, were probably the two, probably the two biggest wild card additions that we didn't know we needed uh, Mm -hmm. heading into the first two all-star install installments. I mean, that's just, it's just kind of facts. Um, you know, Hassel is somebody that I think is kind of overdue for a uh, return on a future All Star season, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. But yeah, well, I don't know. I hope. I hope so. Um, I think Anissa placed a curse on Hassel because Anissa made it to the final that season, and Hassel was the one leaving with a broken knee. So. <sighs> Oh, oh, you mean that. Okay, never mind. I thought you meant a different kind of curse. Like, like I thought I thought you meant because Anissa's, like, 
Anissa and her didn't end off on great terms, and Anissa's really well connected with. Oh uh, uh, no, no, no! That, like, Just no, okay. put a curse into the universe. No, I, I don't think that's stopping production from casting Hassella. I think it's entirely Hassella's call. I just think that she's yeah. a she's been recovering from an injury. Mm -hmm. That was the first reasons why we haven't seen her in the first couple of years that followed. But now I think it's more so just like life circumstances, sure. busy, busy working, raising children. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth of all stars. For for some people, this is like their one chance to come back. And relive a moment in their life, and they may not get that again. And at least we have that one season with Hisella because she was great. Yeah, well, I mean, those first two seasons, or three, actually, if you kind of want to be technical, because I could have sworn that they did quarantine for the third as well. They did. Um, mm -hmm. Those, like, the first two were definitely um, kind of ironclad. Like they definitely did those during COVID, um, especially the first one. I remember it was definitely heavy COVID times, and um, <clears throat> the second one as well, and then the third one they quarantined for. So um, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, the, you know, people probably might have had chances that they wouldn't have had to maybe come back normally, depending on uh, what their life circumstances were. I think COVID opened up a lot of doors for certain people mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, things being shut down and closed. Maybe they need the money or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, some people lost their job and now all of a sudden you have an opportunity to travel for free. Why not take it? Right. Like Cook, I mean, you know, we probably will never see her again in my personal opinion. Yeah, that's a, that's a and hard we, loss. You know, I'm going to say it. Um, although Jemmy is great TV, I think if we can go back and change one thing in time. Uh, I think Jemmy's got to, she's got to, you know, take, sit this one out. Uh, on All Stars One, if it means getting Cook on the show, just because we would have unlimited opportunities to see Jemmy again. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Jemmy, it's it's pretty much you know. I mean, she did All Stars Three. Obviously, you know, unfortunate circumstances made her have to leave early, mm -hmm. but you know, she did say yes to the call. And um, you know, I think Jemmy, when it comes to All Stars, probably has you know unlimited opportunities to do those calls. Whereas, like, you know, somebody like a cook who we hadn't seen forever and still haven't seen, that would have been, you know, our lone chance to strike while the iron's hot kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which, you know, was kind of sad, but I've got one here and it's like a few, um, it's a few, uh, final reckoning moments that are kind of like I mean, we've kind of talked about that we've already talked about the tony and Corey thing at nauseum but i actually got the devin and bananas uh fight um from that same night where devin followed him around the house and the bananas said the stuff about like devin's dad and whatever um that entire fight's kind of ugly in my opinion like i actually believe it or not have an uncomfortable rewatch with that not even necessarily because of the comments, just but like the sheer nature of like how like testy it got. Like it was just like really like yeah, it got like kind of really too uh too real and raw, I feel like there. Yeah, and nothing nothing against Devin and his decision to come back, but you can kind of tell that he there was still some healing that had to be done. And perhaps, you know, when people pass away, their relatives want to get back to regular life and they want to embrace those opportunities. So I would never fault Devin for going back to the show, but mm -hmm. it it does come across that he may may have not been in the right place to compete at that point. Um, but to be honest with you, even rewatching the whole thing, I kind of agree with Banana's assessment there. Not that I would, not that I justify Banana's comments, but 
Devin wanted Bananas to snap. He wasn't following him around for no reason. He wanted he wanted a reaction, <coughs> and he didn't get the one he expected. Yeah, my question is, you know, the whole rumor floating around about how initially Darrell was supposed to be coming in with Corey during that. Let's say Devin just decides to not go back. And had it been Darrell as Corey's partner, we obviously don't get the bananas Devin fight aspect. But my question is, do we still get the body slam over the pasta? Or like, I mean, possibly, right? Because, I mean, the only thing I can think of is if Darrell is more preview to what's going on, does he like do, do a better job of like getting Corey away and from that situation than Devin did? I mean. Yeah, I I really don't know. I don't see anything in this butterfly effect that would prevent Tony from getting body slammed. Um, you know, ultimately, I think the real catalyst here is Tony throwing the pasta out the window. And I I would guess in that moment, Darrell's laughing along. Because throwing pasta out the window, I don't I don't want anyone to be a litter bug. That's that's terrible. But it's kind of funny. Yeah. Listen, I'm more of a penny vodka guy. So fettuccine Alfredo, it, while very good, I wouldn't lose my marbles over it. Oh, I have Corey's back all day. Fettuccine Alfredo. Fettuccine. Listen, I mean, it's, it's great pasta. Honestly, you know what? Now that you mention that, um, I'm making it my life's mission tomorrow to find – Best fettuccine Alfredo in my area that I could find because I haven't had it in a while. And um, now you've actually got me craving because uh, while I have been having pasta recently, it's been a lot of um, rigatoni and penny vodkas. So I need to uh, expand my horizons a little bit since we're on this topic. So why the hell not? Hey, you. I don't know if you're in South Africa, but you might find some on the side of the road. Okay. Listen, I. I'm, I'm not here to disparage possibly what might have very well. Actually, maybe it was pretty good. I mean, it sounded like Corey. I mean, Corey could have just been hamming it up for the show. But, like, I'm actually genuinely curious if that was actually any good pasta. Because I do hear mixed things about, like, I mean, granted, it was an outside restaurant. So, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think hear it's mixed the, things about the food that they do. The principle like. of the fact that they got to go out to a restaurant and they're not privy to that type of a privilege all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so Corey was able to get a meal that wasn't like catering and have it. And then Tony just threw out the window. The catering sounds horrible for what it seems Yeah. Like. From what I hear, it kind of depends. It depends on where you are. But um, I also hear that in most cases, it's more so people getting sick of the food. Because they'll get the same thing over and over and over. Like um, rice and yeah. chicken, probably. Like, I rem I don't know why this sticks out in my mind, but Kayla was like, yeah, it, I don't know what season they were on, but she was like, they gave me rice and beans every day. I grew up eating that, so whatever. Like, it's, it like it's dirty. Not For whatever reason, I kind of feel like that's dirty 30. <laughs> Could have been. Yeah. Rice but, beans. um. Trying to think if I have the only other one I have written down, and I know that there are a million in the world, but, um, is on allegedly my favorite season, Spies, Lies, and Allies, when Josh, Bessie, and Esther get into that big old fight with Amber over pizza, um, which I think is actually kind of relevant to the current season because. We see Josh and Tori get into a fight when Tori was making jokes about like Kylan and Naya hooking up. Mm -hmm. And Tori was also the one that spread the little rumor that Fessy ate Amber's pizza. So, like, we see Josh getting into these big arguments, but there's this little drama fairy going around named Tori that's putting these seeds of doubt in people's minds. Um, and that's a good point, actually, that you bring that yeah. up. It kind of feels like that few details uh, gets lost through the cracks of like challenge lore a little bit. But that's actually a good point to bring up. Um, 
Wow. I don't know how Josh, 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 uh, Josh didn't get kicked off um, as well in addition to Fessy because clearly he threw a drink and cut Fessy. Yeah, I mean, it it doesn't make sense to me. I actually think that Fessy was very rational in all things considered in that situation, at least from what I saw. Um, so I really don't think anyone should have gone home. That wasn't that, that wild, but if anyone should have, it would have been Josh. Well, I mean, I didn't really have any other – like soul instances. I mean, there was like the whole like Brad and Darrell situation, but that's been talked about a lot. And then like as a whole, like the ruins. But outside of that, I mean, I mean, you could include if we're talking real world stuff, there's obviously like, you know, endless ones, but that's an entire different rabbit hole to yeah. <laughs> get I know down. There are, there are tons more, um, but I guess these are just kind of the first ones that pop into my mind. Yeah. Well, speaking of popping into minds, uh, we're going to be keeping our ears and eyes peeled for any other relevant talking points that happen within the next couple weeks or so as we gear the second half of season 40 to, um, you know, if something rings a bell, odds are we're going to end up turning it into a discussion. Um, but, yeah. Until then, hope you guys enjoyed this video, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, good chat.